My name is Katherine Henry, and I'm a software developer here at Clearwater Analytics. Today, I'll be covering an overview of natural language processing and how I worked with a number of fundamental concepts in finding a solution towards the automatic generation of questions and answers from a given text, in this case, Wikipedia articles. This presentation includes a number of fundamental NLP tools, which can be useful for anyone looking to start working with NLP, or natural language processing. Generally in life, my motivation is pizza. But in this case, there was a little bit more to it. <laughs> my last semester at Boise State, I took a class in natural language processing where we were expected to propose our own final projects. Because I was working at Clearwater at the time as well, <laughs> I knew that Soda did some work with NLP, so I reached out to Mike for some relevant ideas. He pointed out that the creation of questions and answers for trainings can be a time-consuming and at times tedious process. And this is where my problem was born, and consequently, my project. I, I wanted to answer how can we automatically process some given text and generate applicable questions and answers. The key here was relevant and applicable questions and answers. It is fairly trivial to simply pull out any sentence and word and call that your question and answer pair. I needed my questions and answers to be fairly well representative of the text as a whole. My solution is a work in progress. <laughs> but I used the NLP libraries and the power of Python in an attempt to solve my problem. I'll be covering a number of NLP tools I used. I've grouped them into three primary categories, keyword extraction, lexical semantics, and what a corpus or corpora is. With an understanding of these tools, I'll go through a high level overview of how I work to solve the problem at hand. This will be followed by a brief introduction of some of the key libraries I used. Finally, there's always room for improvement, so I've included some ideas I'm considering for moving forward. Statistical NLP is the application of statistical techniques for the automatic analysis of natural human language. It is important. Moving forward, it is crucial to remember that although statistics is most certainly important, linguistics is equally so. Please be certain not to confuse linguistics with linguini. There's a great focus on the linguistic side of NLP in this presentation. Given a character sequence and a body of text, tokenization is the task of chopping it up into pieces called tokens. Perhaps at the same time, you'll clean or normalize your text, throwing away certain characters such as punctuation or overly frequent words known as stop words. Stop words are extremely common words that appear to <coughs> offer very little value. You can use a pre-compiled pre list of these stop words, which is what I did, or you can determine them by frequency. They often consist of determiners, prepositions, etc. There are a number of challenges with tokenization, and a number of them vary per language. In English, you'll regularly need to handle hyphenation, apostrophes, white space, tabs, lowercase, etc. For example, with San Francisco, we treat it as a single word in our vocabulary, so you can't simply tokenize it based on space. Tokenization in German is a challenge of its own because they write compound nouns without spaces. Consequently, tokenizing German will often consist in seeing if the German word can be divided into multiple smaller words from the given vocabulary. In this instance, we could take Fußbodenschleifmaschinenverlei and put it in five smaller words. Fuß or foot, Boden or floor, Schleif or the act of sanding, Machinen, which is the plural of machines, and Philae, a rental, where you pay money. <laughs> Morphology is the study of words, how they're formed, and the relationship to other words in the same language. Words are made up of a stem and zero or more affixes. In the English language, these affixes consist of a prefix or a suffix. A morpheme is the smallest unit of measurement a word can be broken into. For example, Dogs can be broken into the word dog, which means something along the lines of a four-legged furry animal we spend a lot of time with, and s, which carries or embodies the meaning of plural. Determining your stem word is useful in NLP because it decreases the size of your vocabulary while maintaining meaning. What I have shown here is a course, oh shoot, my, my notes weren't scrolled. <laughs> A part of speech tagger is a program that reads text and language and assigns part of speech to each word and symbol. The granularity can vary depending on which set of tags is used. What I have shown here is a coarse tag set. However, later we will take a look at the brown corpus, which uses a more fine-grained tag set. Recalling back to grade school, there are various parts of speech, including prepositions, 
verbs, and nouns. They can be seen here as IN, NN, and VB, respectively. Some words can have more than one tag associated with them. For example, play can be a noun or verb, depending on the context. There are a variety of methods and options available for part of speech taggers. Whichever you choose, it should generally be robust enough to make accurate decisions about tags. However, natural language is complex, and this can sometimes be difficult. Fortunately, the occasional error is usually not too large of a concern. Now I'll begin covering my second iteration of tools, lexical semantics. Semantics is the study of language meaning, and a lexical item is a single word, part of a word, or a chain of words that form the basic elements of a language's lexicon, or vocabulary. When working with lexical semantics, you'll want to keep in mind the following questions. What an individual lexical item means, why does it mean what it does, and how can we represent this? Because computers don't understand words, we have to represent them and their meaning is numbers. So how do we do this? There have been instances where people line up every word in their vocabulary and assign it a number, like so. However, all this teaches the computer is that words are related by some distance. We can't say that love is greater or smaller than programming because that would be treating them as numbers rather than the labels that they truly are. Alternatively, you could try one hot encoding, where you take each word and put it in a separate, unique vector. This solves the issue of false assumptions based on distance because everything is equidistant. However, there are no clear connections to any other words. Simply, many large vectors with lots of zeros and one one in a different position representing each word. We know what programming and math are, at least, or we know that they're at least similar in meaning. They're often found in a similar context and are used to solve similar problems. They're certainly more semantically similar to one another than they are the concept of love, for example. Looking at these word vectors, there's no clear way to recognize these differences or similarities. Rather, we're relying on our understanding as English speakers of what these words mean. The prior two examples haven't done much to help computers understand words or their meanings. In order to solve my problem, I needed to find a way to demonstrate the meaning of each to a computer. I accomplished this by making distance meaningful. Now you do this using distributional semantics and co-occurrence matrices. It turns out, when parsing text, you get a lot of value by representing a word by means of its neighbors. This logic is not so simply applied when working with speech as the data is generally not as structured. Fortunately, my project involved working with text. If I wanted to know what dog means, I'll look at thousands of instances of dog and text, and I'll note the environment it appears in. Perhaps it regularly appears around ball, canine, pet, or leash. Other words appearing in this context would be semantically similar. For example, I have dog, pet, and iguana. They show up around similar contexts of leash and walk. I would say, given this limited context, Dog, pet, and iguana are semantically similar. Word co-occurrence statistics is computed by counting how two or more words occur together in a given text. This allows us to make distance meaningful. Taking our sentence, I love programming, I love math, I tolerate biology, we can create the following word co-occurrence matrix. For this example, I used a window size of one for simplicity. This means each word is defined by its neighboring word to the left as well as to the right. A window of 5 to 10 tends to be more common, although researchers are still trying to determine the best tolerance for a window when working with word company. In the first sentence, the word love is defined by the word I to the left and program to the right. So the value for both I love and the love programming co-occurrence is incremented. After repeating that process, for each window we are left with this co-occurrence matrix. Now the co-occurrence matrix is filled and we're able to plot its results into a multi-dimensional space. In this case, it would be 6D. Since programming and math share the same co-occurrence values, they would be placed in the exact same location. So in this very limited context, they would mean pretty much the same thing. Here's a 2D image showing the compressed six-dimensional space of our co-occurrency matrix. This allows for a simplified view of our words and their distance or meaning. Again, you see how math and programming overlap. Similarly, words which don't have the same meaning are some distance away. Biology is closer in proximity and consequently meaning to programming or math than love is, for example. 
Word co-occurrence matrices can be incredibly powerful for determining semantic and syntactic relationships, but they are also computationally expensive as you would generally be working with massive matrices due to having a much larger amount of text. In linguistics, a corpus is a collection of machine-readable texts, and they are generally quite large. It is important to note that a corpus is a coherent body of text as found in the real world, opposed to a bunch of made-up phrases. Deciding a corpus to use depends on what you want to accomplish. Do you need written or spoken data? Do you need fiction, non-fiction, conversations, or tweets? Common Crawl, for example, is an absolutely massive corpus available for free. It contains raw web page data, metadata extracts, and text extracts. And of course, you have Wikipedia. With the English Wikipedia alone containing over 3.41 billion words, it's a massive resource and easily accessible corpus. The Brown Corpus was the first million word electronic corpus of English. It was created in 1961 at the Brown University and was tagged with part of speech markers over the course of many years. This corpus contains text from 500 sources, and the sources have been categorized by genre, such as news, editorial, and so on. We will take a closer look at the mystery genre of Hitchens, Footsteps in the Night. As I mentioned before, the brown corpus is an example of a fine-grained part of speech tag set. So you end up with a more detailed set of tags. For verbs alone, you have tags such as VB for its base form, VBD, a verb in past tense, <coughs> VBG, verb present participle, and VBN, verb past participle. And that's not all of them. Additionally, tags may have hyphenations. As you can see with dad, the tag TL is hyphenated to the regular tag of NN, a singular or mass noun, because it's a title. This concludes my three tool sets. I covered keyword extraction, lexical semantics, and what a corpus is. We are now ready to take a look at how I went about trying to solve my problem. I have three key steps in my process. I determine and extract key sentences from a given text. These sentences become my individual questions. I then determine the most relevant keyword or phrase in each of these individual sentences. This becomes my answer. I finally determine semantically similar words to my answer, and these become my multiple choice options. Most people are familiar with books. So for this presentation, I elected to test my program on the Wikipedia article for what a book is. I used a Python library called Wikipedia. It made getting and parsing data from Wikipedia a trivial process. With this library, you can do various things like search Wikipedia or get article summaries. It is a much improved step from when I started out copy and pasting entire articles and hoping for the best. This is the exact output I get querying for the article on books from Wikipedia. You'll note there is some formatting on the text. For example, titles are surrounded by double equals similar to Markdown. I went through and manually removed a number of these markups by hand for a slightly cleaner text. This is certainly a process that could and should be automated. <laughs> these 10 pages represent the entirety of my Wikipedia article on books. This is where my first library, PyTextRank, comes into play. There are 20 sentences I've highlighted. Each sentence was determined by PyTextRank to be key to the entire text. These key sentences are distributed fairly evenly, which is important because I don't want to only generate questions from the first half or the ending paragraph of a given text. My set of questions ought to be fairly comprehensive. There are 20 questions because I manually entered 20 questions we generated. <laughs> I likely could have done better with a larger set, but the spread is still fairly consistent and I wanted to keep things relatively small for this presentation. Here's a selection of the key sentences I've grabbed using PyTextRank. Taking a look at a couple, they appear to be fairly descriptive of what a book is. You might have noticed that I have a rogue equal sign present. This is another reason to make sure you're thorough in cleaning your text. In my case, it's a negligible problem, but depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you may run into trouble with a random symbol showing up. Because the Wikipedia article is far too long to display on a single presentation slide, I fit as much as I could, and it just so happens there are two key sentences present. We'll be following these two sentences through the rest of the process. It is this step where I take advantage of rake NLTK. I already have my key sentences available to me, but I wanted to identify any keywords or phrases specific to these key sentences. 
This is an attempt to select the most relevant word out of the sentence rather than the entire context if a better one exists. In the second sentence, a single word, libraries, was determined to be the key word for the sentence. Simple enough. Things were slightly more complicated for the first sentence, as a key phrase was extracted. I can't have three words as a fill-in-the-blank multiple choice question, so I removed two of the three. For my implementation, if a phrase was selected, I would take advantage of part of speech tagging and select the noun if available. If there was not a noun present, I tossed the question. You can see here the part of speech tags for each keyword or phrase from my key sentences. Looking at single sheet within, you have three tags, an adjective of JJ, a noun of NN, and a preposition of IN. Alternatively to throwing out the questions, if there was not a noun present, I could have had a list of tags, which I would accept as viable keywords in order of preference. This would have allowed me additional flexibility if there was not a noun present to select the adjective single, for example, instead. These questions here would make great fill-in-the-blank questions. You have the understanding that books can be found in libraries, and a single sheet in a book is a leaf. However, for my project, I wanted to go a step further and provide multiple choice options, and this is where my semantic analysis came into play. I used word to vec for semantic analysis to determine words I could use for my multiple choice options. Shown here is the output from word to vec a set of words ordered by their proximity in an n-dimensional space to my keyword. In the case of libraries, it performed fairly well. Most of these results would be a decent fit for the question. Sheets, on the other hand, needed some help contextually. <laughs> the result from word to vec for the most part have to do with betting. <laughs> this is a problem I ran into frequently and generally resulted in a useless set of multiple choice options. However, I attempted to salvage what I could and continue on. I cleaned up some of the results by throwing out any words that shared the same stem as my answer. So the plural of sheets was tossed. I ended up with these two questions. The first one is decent. It would, however, be somewhat frustrating as technically a number of the options are correct, especially librarians versus libraries. <laughs> the second question is a flop. The lack of context in my word to vec results leaves me with a confusing set of possible answers, and in this case, the correct answer is fairly obvious. I've included some additional examples of questions and answers my program produced on the Wikipedia article for books. I won't spend time reading over each one, but the slides will be available if you wanted to take a closer look later. You'll notice here that essays and essay both occur as multiple choice options for the first question. I didn't do any checks on if word to vec results shared the same stem, but it would clearly be a nice feature. The second question is another great example of context getting the best of me. Most of my results from word to vec have to do with a phone app. Here I have some slightly improved results from when I ran my program on a different, more technical paper. I found my program performed significantly better when applied to technical papers. I imagine this is because they have a more precise language. The questions shown are some of the results from my program being run on a report about OpenDial, a toolkit for developing spoken dialogue systems with probabilistic rules. I chose this report because one of the authors was my professor for the class, Dr. Kennington. I've included a link to it below. I'll only be covering the first question and briefly at that, but again, my slide should be available, again later, or available later. Looking at the multiple choice options for this question, they really do fit better than any of my previous examples. Someone unfamiliar with the topic may be tempted to select any one of them. However, dialogue is the correct answer. Although these results were better, even technical papers could be a hit or miss. My first instinct was to do a paper on Java, the programming language. I would often end up with multiple choice options involving lattes and mochas. I will now briefly cover the three libraries I used in my program. PyTextRank is written in Python and backed by the popular TextRank algorithm. I used it to determine meaningful key sentences in my text, sentences that ideally could be used as a summary of the text. PyTextRank leverages Spacey, an open source software library for advanced natural language processing, for part of speech tagging and normalization. It's written in Python and Cython. PyTextRank <coughs> also, as I mentioned, leverages the popular TextRank algorithm introduced in 2004. It's a very, very high-level overview of text rank and how it helped me determine my key sentences. You start by adding each sentence as a vertex in a graph. 
Because sentences aren't expected to be repeated in the text, you cannot use co-occurrence. Rather, the similarity between sentences, or the word overlap, is calculated and used as an edge weight between vertices. This results in a highly connected graph where the weight on each edge indicates the strength of the connections established between various sentences in the text. Then, the text rank ranking algorithm is run. The basic idea behind it is there is a voting or recommendation system in place. When one vertex links to another one, it is basically casting a vote for that other vertex. The higher the number of votes, the higher the importance of the vertex. When computing the score associated with a vertex in the graph, the text rank ranking algorithm also takes into account the edge weights calculated earlier from the word overlap between sentences. The top ranked sentences, or vertices, produced from this ranking algorithm are then selected as my questions. Such a process is important because I don't want one of my questions being on the only sentence about dogs found in the Wikipedia article about cats. Rake NLTK tries to determine key phrases in a body of text by analyzing the frequency of word appearance in conjunction with its co-occurrence to other words in the text. Although TextRank offers keyword extraction in addition to the sentence extraction I used, Rake NLTK is said to be more computationally efficient than TextRank while achieving higher precision. I also had better success with Rake NLTK, Rake NLTK on the smaller text input of individual sentences. I use word to vec to determine words semantically similar to my keyword or answer for my multiple choice options. I couldn't just use a synonym because they're simply a word or phrase that means exactly or nearly the same thing as your initial word. They simply wouldn't make sense for multiple choice options. When provided with enough data, usage, and contexts, word to vec can make highly accurate guesses about a word's meaning based on past appearances. Word to vec will output word projections in a latent space of n dimensions, with n being the size of the word vectors obtained. My multiple choice options consisted of selecting the top five words closest in proximity to my answer. The examples of distributional semantics and co-occurrence matrices from before are a high level demonstration of this. When using word to vec and visualizing your n space as 2D, it is easy to see how words begin to cluster around words of similar meaning. For example, weekdays might cluster together, first names, etc. Words that appear in similar contexts turn out to have similar meaning, so they get similar vectors after your model is trained sufficiently. Here, ideally, I have a live example to help you visualize in a 2D space how your words will cluster together. So, I can not see that, but this is one for she. It started out with she, and you can see the words we saw kind of clustering around it. But if you update it to worksheet, you'll have an adjusted group of clustering around worksheet. It's just kind of a fun interactive thing. Currently, my word to vec is trained on Twitter data. Oh, I don't think you can see this. Oh no, sorry. Whoop. There we go. Currently, my word to vec is trained on Twitter data. Perhaps it would be more beneficial. I'm skipping a step. This is my room for improvement slide. <laughs> <laughs> and currently, my word to vec is trained on Twitter data. My thought is that it might be more beneficial to train it on contextually relevant data. This can be difficult, however, because I would need to acquire on the fly context relevant corpora, which generally needs to be absolutely massive. So, I considered querying Wikipedia on the fly and pulling out a number of articles and compiling them and massaging them into what I needed, but that sounded like a lot of work and I don't think I'd get as much data as I needed. Secondly, I've considered, and this is a little bit complicated, so bear with me, or maybe it's not, but <laughs> I pull out my keywords out of my initial text, the one I'm hoping to create questions and answers out of. I hold on to those and I query Wikipedia for any articles using those words as tags. Those articles then become my contextually relevant articles that I hold on to. Then once I've gone and I've used word to vec to create semantically similar words to my keywords, I check to see if any of those words are found in my contextually similar articles. In theory, any of the words that I see in my articles would potentially be contextually friendly answers for my multiple choice options. Haven't tried it yet, though. <laughs> Additionally, I could filter similar my word to vec results 
that share the same stem amongst one another. So we had librarians versus libraries, if I could filter those out, because again, technically both of those are correct. I could cleverly determine the ideal number of questions to generate based on the size of a text, because I currently have it hard-coded at 20. And as I learned like four days ago, <laughs> there is such a thing as word disambiguation in the Natural Language Toolkit. I think word disambiguation is my golden ticket. In NLP, word, disambi word sense disambiguation is the problem of determining what the sense or meaning of a word is given a particular context. Generally, this is a relatively subconscious process for humans. WordNet is a lexical database for the English, English language from Princeton, and it groups English words into sets of synonyms called synsets. For she alone, there were eight senses where she is a noun and two where she is a verb. And you see there that we have sheet in terms of bedding and sheet is in a piece of paper. So in theory, I could leverage this to my advantage and have more contextually aware answer options. Questions? Do you know if there are efforts to semantically disambiguate using the origin of the word, so Latin roots or Greek roots, things like that? I imagine, I'm somebody with a linguistics major and it was all about that, um, I imagine that they do that. There is an idea of a, I don't have notes on this, so watch me butcher it, but a lexeme where you have walk, is the lexeme of walking and walked and walks, and so I guess it's not the same idea of the root, but I think it reaches out in similar fields. Anything else? Why did you initially choose Twitter as your? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I actually tried on Wikipedia data because I thought, oh, well, that should work really well. But somehow it was way worse. And I just kind of just used different training sets, and Twitter was the best one so far. And I will be investing more time and energy into deciding why. But at the moment, that just happened to be the best fit. Super.